I guess I was sort of in a state of fear where I didn't want to turn around and look. A very friendly, welcoming feeling at one instance. I was starting to feel very anxious and very cold. The outlines of a human body, almost complete and total panic. Very visual experiences. Uh, one of the first ones Here I... at Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, a team is investigating certain common perceptions of the inner mind. So we'll be taking a baseline recording first. Mm -hmm. before we right now, they're looking at the electromagnetic brain patterns seen in people having the near-death experience. Okay, going to compare that. The research is led by Dr. Michael Persinger. Basically, at any given time, all experience is due to those portions of the brain that are most metabolically active. If we can simulate that by applying complex, meaningful magnetic fields to the brain, we can also induce those experiences. This experiment is testing the idea that mystical perceptions and paranormal experiences can be turned on at will, not by hypnosis or shamanic drumming, but by a scientist stimulating nerve activity in the brain. The volunteer sits blindfolded in a soundproof chamber. This sensory deprivation allows the mind to focus on electromagnetic patterns transmitted across the brain through this modified crash helmet. Uh, if you feel anything change with the electrodes... They're able to simulate the exact brain patterns that occur in near-death experiences. Is that comfortable? Dr. Persinger hopes the research will benefit psychotherapy. We tried to evoke the fragments that compose the near-death experience and other mystical experiences, such as detachment, feelings of moving through a tunnel, hearing voices, the sense of a presence, usually on the left side. Our major thrust is ultimately to apply this to dealing with things such as psychological depression. After a while, I remember feeling that there was someone else in the room with me, almost looking over my left shoulder. It was all I could do to not turn my head and want to look. If you stimulate the deep portions of the temporal lobe, so you can get very, very vivid imagery, and the emotional commitment or the emotional sensation that something is profound, real, cosmically real, and personally significant. It's a male voice, but it's like really, really far away. As if you can just sort of like catch a tone you can't really hear. You can tell that it's someone talking. You can distinguish that, but you can't make out any kind of words or anything like that. What we've been doing recently is generating words as magnetic patterns. And even though the person isn't hearing it, through their ears, their brain is interpreting it. So they're actually having fragments of experiences as if they're hearing it when in actual fact they cannot be. These experiences are so strong, they're utterly real for the person who has them. They can be as profound as a religious conversion, yet we can generate them with a machine. These mind games are beginning to shed their secrets. The scientist becomes the shaman. But where are the limits? What else can people be made to believe? Well, one thing that's really clear, you can control the person's experiences and they don't know they're being controlled. That's why this technology is a potentially powerful one and has a two-edge to its sword. As a tool of science, this technology may bring us valuable new understandings of the obscure depths of the human mind. But there's a dark side. In the wrong hands, could it become an instrument of power, a means of oppression? If we're not careful, will mind games one day become mind control? When the 
laboratory, we have reproduced every aspect of the God experience, every essence, every component of it, from the rising sensation to the feelings of ecstasy to the feelings of a sensed presence to the feelings that you're at one with the universe. We can do that experimentally. Professor Persinger has gone straight to the source of creativity, emotion, and fantasy by stimulating this area, the temporal lobes and the limbic system, with complex magnetic fields that set up electrical charges in the brain. In our presence, one subject had a near-death experience. A sudden wave of darkness. It's a distant point of light. No two people have responded in exactly the same way. But all of them come out of this chamber with a profound sense that something hugely significant has taken place. It's a sound chamber that doesn't allow anything from the outside to come inside. And I start hearing voices. I start seeing things. started with faces. There was a lot of faces, but distorted faces, m moving kind of almost like seeing something through heat. I felt a presence behind me, like kind of staring down at me, and it seemed very strange. This presence was, it wasn't, it wasn't frightening at all, it was very comforting actually. It was like dreaming, but I was awake. Just like when you have a dream, sometimes you wake up and your dreams are just so, it was so real. I saw bright lights and I heard voices. Was that God speaking? What, or was that Professor Persinger just flipping a few switches? What we have found is that individuals who show a temporal lobe sensitivity or creativity and who are very religious, in that setting, they will have a religious experience. We can generate the sensed presence, which is defined as God. The, uh, the social phenomena very often determines how you label a phenomena or label an experience. The sensed presence has been with the human species forever. The idea of an entity visiting us, the idea of waking up in the middle of the night and feeling some sentient being nearby, be it positive or negative. Incidentally, the evil ones are usually the left side. The positive talking ones are on the right side. Simply reflects the organization of your brain activity. But the culture determines how you experience it and how you label it. You have an experience that are easy to produce. How you label it and how you then explain it when you wake up will be a function of the cultural label. Fifty years ago, they were almost always visitations by angels. Now, with the emphasis being on aliens, space, the great frontier, now the thrust is towards alien types of experiences. A hundred years ago, they would have been religious. Let's look at the nature of the sense of presence itself. If I ask you who you are, your sense of self, it's primarily a language or left hemispheric process. It's not an accident that people will fight and die to maintain their language and culture. That is yourself. The right side of the brain, the right hemisphere, is more involved with the a sense of a presence. It's like yourself, except that it's more involved with another feeling of an entity, sort of like another self. And you can stimulate it a variety of ways. It can happen during dreams. All right, that's very common every night. You feel, you feel yourself looking at yourself outside of yourself, this double kind of individual. It can also happen... Uh, if you stimulate the brain normally, if you're stressed, particular personal stress. But the majority of time, it's due to strong magnetic fields, by strong I mean generated within nature, stimulating your brain while you're in a special state that we call sleep. If between 2 and 4 o'clock in the morning, there is the appropriate magnetic stimulation, it could be from geomagnetic activity or from something regional, such as strain, and it stimulates the right hemisphere in particular, people have a sensed presence. They suddenly wake up and they feel there's an entity nearby. They may actually feel uh, uh, stimulations of their body. Men tend to experience uh, anal stimulation, women uterine stimulation, and the reason is because the area of the brain that's stimulated is involved with the internal states, with the uterus, with the internal states. You feel like you're floating. You may actually have the sensation of a, of a presence touching you. In a room void of sensory stimuli, Dr. Persinger asked his subjects to put on a special helmet that was capable of modifying the electromagnetic waves experienced by the brain. In this controlled environment, several participants said that they sensed the presence of strangers in the room, and some even claimed to see unknown entities. It's actually very easy to induce an entity experience. 
80% of everyone who goes through our laboratory through particular patterns of fields have a sensed presence. How they experience it will be, effect will be a function of what they expect. Well, one of the questions we, we've asked, we've been asked many times, is the kinds of patterns we apply to people in the laboratory. Do they occur in nature? And the answer is yes, they do, because that's where we got them. We've actually gone out into the field where people have experienced haunts or have been abducted. We record the magnetic disturbances, which are usually transient, they're not there all the time. And we record them on our equipment. Stan Corner and I very often go out and record them on fancy equipment. Bring them back, digitize them, and then apply them to the brain and produce the same experiences. Actually, we find that there is about 10 to 20% of the population that's really prone, very sensitive to the environment. They're the kind of canaries of our culture. The sense of the mind canaries, they are very sensitive to the electromagnetic fields. They are the creative ones. They're even musicians, they're writers. They have tremendous versatility in their thoughts. Sometimes they may even be considered crazy, but the point is, is because of their ideas are so creative. These people's brains are so sensitive that with the right pattern of activity generated through their brain, naturally, they experience a sensed presence. Fifty years ago, they would probably have said they were visited by angels. A hundred years ago, by demons, incubi and succubi, that would take sexual, would steal sexual favors from them. Now, of course, the entire phenomenon of the succubi and the incubi has been replaced with the alien abduction because that's the society in which we live.